And tonight is episode 11. Did I already say that? 11. I'm feeling a little ADD tonight. 11, and tonight we're going to talk about the forehand, the forehand ground stroke. There's not much on the forehand ground stroke when you Google, let's say, modern forehand. Not much comes up, huh? I think you once said 20,000 <laughs> choices for the modern forehand and less than, less than 20 for the modern backhand. What I want to know is when is the modern forehand going to be... Actually, they, they've already changed this. I've seen this before. It's next gen. The next gen, next gen forehand. Next gen physics. The forehand. The forehand has definitely changed. That's one thing between old school, new school with years ago with um, three of the grand slams on grass, players yeah. playing with wooden rackets. Right. By the second week, I mean, at the grand slams, the players be wearing spikes. So they didn't want to let the ball bounce. Yeah. I always talk about Welby Van Horn, how he's so great with teaching beginners, his body balance positions. And he used the term beginner's grip and championship grip. Mm -hmm. So when players were you know, done with the 14s, so they're 15 years old, he would change them. Going to Charlie Hollis, laborer's coach, it wasn't a true continental grip, but close to a continental grip, yeah. or composite made of two parts. The base knuckle would be on the top of the third panel. Uh, towards the second panel and the, yeah. the heel pad definitely on three and um when welby was in his 90s he lived to be 94 i can remember visiting him in a nursing home extended care and watching um federer play mm -hmm. and, and welby knew that um and that's why he was so good same with someone like vic braden i have a film of vic braden from the 60s teaching tennis when you find a way to do something better you do it better yeah um so yeah, the forehand, I think, to go enter the beginner's world, it's like you got the, your forehead and you got the back of your head. With the backhand, you go with the back of your hand, your knuckles, it's palm guidance. Yeah. So, goes your, so goes your palm, so goes your forehand. I think when the kids are really, really young, early child development classes should really teach a young player two-handed forehand. I'll say if they're right-handed, um, you have your right hand on the bottom for every stroke, overhead, serve, Two-handed backhand, one-handed backhand, backhand volley, underspin backhand. The forehand, the right hand's on the bottom. The only shot is you switch. So you're from a developmental standpoint, you're not hitting cross-handed. Yeah. Um, so when you the ball goes to the forehand side, then you then you have to switch. But the reason to ha have a young player hit a two-handed forehand is the racket's so heavy, so they can hold the racket higher longer. They can use a conventional grip. Yeah. And they end up having a shorter swing. It's amazing how many young players um, have to switch from a, a extreme, extreme Western grip. Yeah, and that's one thing with the transitional balls. That the idea is, well, the, the ball is going to bounce lower, so people won't have an extreme grip. The little kid grip, every ball, if someone is five years old, the balls <laughs> a waist level ball for an adult is above their head. They go up like this with the Western grip. The racket faces vertical. Yeah, no, it's a great tip for people out there if you have a longer swing on your forehand. If you're an adult player, um, senior player, pro player, you just uh, two hands for a little bit. Just, oh, you as, can, yeah, just you, as a drill, you can help. For sure. Uh, just to go to a backhand, do a backboard and hit a few balls two-handed. With um, Roger Federer, when he used a tiny tyke, there's film of him hitting two-handed. Yeah. The doll until he was uh, into the 12s. He was playing 12 and under tennis, and he had a two-handed forehand. I've heard you say that. It would be great to see some footage of that. The, um, you have a better chance developing a one-handed backhand volley by hitting a two-handed backhand volley. You have yeah. a better chance of developing a forehand initially. Kevin Curran is amazing as far as change. He got to the NCAA final hitting a two-handed forehand, and he got to the Wimbledon final hitting a one-handed forehand. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I just think of uh, with palm guidance on the forehand side, you know, really, especially if you have an Eastern grip where the palm is flush with the strings and it's, you really can use your palm as a guide. So another reason for kids to start out with an Eastern grip it's just to really have that feeling of, of yeah I, i'm emphatic about having a kid or, you know we were doing a, a project with a few eight-year-olds is to have an eastern grip don't let them slide yeah even though it can be advantageous the grip determines the angle racket face the angle racket face determines the angle racket path yeah but besides the grip you're trying to align the wrists the elbow and tennis is a sport where you have to play random shots it's not just forehand ground strokes yeah. i mean you have to be able to hit the forehand return first and you know then there's a conventional forehand volley the forehand volley so um yeah the, the grip uh 
we've shared this before, but we filmed 50 boys and 50 girls, the national 12s. Mm -hmm. It was over five years ago now, but over 90% of the players had some version of a Western grip. So that's where the, the wrist, the grip is Western. The wrist is below the racket, elbows pointing straight down. It's almost like the racket's hitting their earlobe. Yeah. And the contact point is at eye level. Yeah. And, you know, um, Sonia Hennen, Sophia Hennen, Sonia Hennen, which one is it? Kennen. Kennen, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, players change. I mean, she's someone six years old on the cover of Vantage magazine. Um, James Blake, Vince Spadia, um, Andre Agassi. You just go on and on. I mean, yeah. how almost... It seems like almost every player, but they have that passion. They start playing early, mm -hmm. and they don't they don't play with um, an efficient grip. Yeah, I mean, with the with the transition balls, it can help them to get a more manageable contact point. I think that's big. But like you said, you know, they they want to get the two inch trophy. I guess Vic used to say that all the time. You know, kids just want to get the two inch trophy, and so they go out there and get those crazy grips. No, like winning is confusing. It's totally confusing. When, um, that's where we, ideally when you start a young player, it'd be better if they were playing multiple sports, learn to be on a team. And actually, when you think about little kid tennis, you know, baseline to baseline, 78 feet away, they could, you know, call it the lollipop, the, the loop, yeah. the high arcing ground stroke, the rainbow, moon ball. <laughs> moon ball. Um, so I, Welby Van Horn used to teach the serve last because he didn't want kids to play. You know, the Russian Spartak, mm -hmm. you know, 3,000 hours before you play. Oh, yeah. That's not happening here in America. <laughs> or in many with, places. The, with the forehand, years ago, there used to be so many arguments on loop versus straight back. Should mm -hmm. you switch grips on volleys? And it seems like today the, the argument, it doesn't get past the forehand. And actually, it's, it's like there's not that much discussion on any other shot but the forehand. And it's really just the forehand... Well, now it gets into the ready position, but it's really the forehand follow through, you know, the windshield wiper versus extending out or, you know, all the fancy stuff or on pronation and supination and, you know, lag and all that kind of stuff. Well, we have um, listeners that have followed us for some time, which we appreciate, but new listeners, uh, Jeff Lewis, who I helped as a player way back when he was a teenager, and then as a teacher, I love his video, the forehand spoof. Yeah, Noah Atala. Noah Atala. <laughs> um, Coach Noah Atala. The, you know, sometimes you watch people explain the forehand and say, well, that'd be okay if you were throwing a discus. You know, they don't think about the next shot. I mean, your center of gravity, um, you're ending up facing almost the fence behind you. That's definitely the side fence. Yeah. And there's research where it takes about eight tenths of a second to get back in a center position. And that equates into eight eight um, feet going forward. Yeah. So any, a lot of the top players in the world, because of their forehand, they can't really transition to the net very well. Yeah. But they're warriors. They're physical specimens. They're warriors. And, but again, there's some players that on, on the pro tour that their forehand, they think it's a liability, but really as far as being an all court player, um, they think it's an asset. I'm sorry. Yeah. They think it's an asset, but, but by being an all, to be an all court player, it's really a liability. Yeah. Vic talk, Vic Braden used to talk about that a lot where, the center of gravity, you know, with an open stance and also just with over rotation, they had no chance to get to the net. You know, you're criticized today if you're teaching someone to hit a square conventional step out forehand. Yeah. But if kids are always hitting an open stance, when you finally have them hit off their front foot, they're, they're just too close to the ball. You really should be able to hit a closed stance where you're forced to step across your body diagonally. You have to adjust your back foot. Conventional straight out, semi-open and open. You need to be able to do the whole thing, but there's there's too many players on the forehand side that just hit open and semi-open stance forehands. I can't remember who it was, but I heard someone got to practice with Nadal at the French Open on clay for sure. And it's like, you know, what really stood out? And it was, he stepped into every single forehand. So when these guys practice, especially Nadal, I mean, I've been on court level with him several times in the photo pit there filming and uh, yeah, he's trying to step into every single forehand. But then obviously when you play, everything's so dynamic and on the run, and that's not always going to happen. But yeah, I like to think he's about, warming up and practicing, he's stepping into every ball. I like to think about, you know, where I heard something for the first time. Ron Holmberg was a top 10 player, American player. 
And he used to hire students that I trained for his tennis camp, Ron Holmberg tennis camp. He used to use the term violent topspin. Mm. And I think in Nadal. Yeah. I mean, the RPMs, I mean, he's definitely swinging up. He definitely understands that in the rally, baseline to baseline, topspin's your best friend. Yeah. But also, too, is Nadal, um, with, with his grip, he's always tried to come closer to an Eastern grip because oh, yeah. so he could hit through the court. Yeah. It's come over for sure. With, uh, think of uh, Jack Kramer, what he said about Del Potro's Eastern forehand grip. Mm-hmm. He said this to Pam Shriver. Uh, it wasn't um, that uh, many years or that much time before he passed away. He said, Pammy, <laughs> that's how you hit a forehand, where it's just like a sledgehammer. Yeah. Because if you have an Eastern grip, Again, if you close, if you have a Western grip, when the angle of the racket face is down degree for degree, inch for inch, you have to swing up. So mm-hmm. many young junior players, they don't realize they're doing well because they can hit excessive top. But they're hitting short all the time. Mm-hmm. And really, really little kid tennis. I remember Paul McDonald, a teaching pro in Chicago, who worked for Braden. Yeah. He used to say, little kid tennis, if you hit short, it works for you. <laughs> because, you know, the kid comes up and they, they, they go to the net to lose at a faster rate. Yeah, exactly. But with... Uh, you know, the, the grip is key, but when it comes down to um, how someone starts, you know, do they do off-court training? Do, you know, baseball players will hit off a tee. They'll stand in the on-deck circle and they'll shadow swing. But I think too many times uh, we've got a young Irish player. He's 22 years old, he's doing an internship. And I was talking to him this evening, and he's basically learned tennis through trial and error. Yeah. He knows now that he wasn't given specific directions i always tell people you're going to tell someone to go to the gas station in the gas station you just have to leave your driveway and you, you you take a right and it's just a mile down the road well if you take a left that doesn't mean you have to drive all the way around the world to find the gas station <laughs> but it's just going to take you more time if you you take the wrong turn yeah exactly so directions apply at tennis yeah the uh, last week we were interviewing matt clore who hits the ball really well but, you know, now is into teaching. We were talking about that teaching and where, uh, you know, we're always singing his praises on, on how well he hits the ball. And with a lot of the players that he works with, he can beat, take sets off. But there's some times where you see where his racket. Yeah, he was always asking me to look at how he hits the ball. And yeah. um, he's given too many rhythm hits. Right. Tennis teaching pro-itis. Yeah. Um, say, for example, a tennis teaching pro, they're up at the net and they, they don't think they miss volleys, but you have to remember you're hitting with Sally from the country club or you're hitting <laughs> with little Tommy yeah. and they're really racket face open, taking speed off the shot. Yeah. But no, Matt, he will have, slow the racket down. Right. Because if you hold the racket higher longer, you generate more racket hit speed. Yeah. And let it fly because he's always given a rhythm hit and then it's brain memory. He's programmed. Yeah. How you worked with Vic, uh, Vic brain like you did, but obviously I was working with Vic starting out in 79 and a Colombian, uh, Ruben Perchek was introduced to Ruben by Kim Wittenberg, who later worked for Vic as well. I remember all the staff members were saying, Steve, Steve, Vic's going to say his swing's too big. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, he's not. And that was one time I was right (laughs) because he had the racket up high. Yeah. And the, the further the racket falls, you know, Tom Ocker was a top 10 player in the world from the Netherlands the Dutch windmill, slight of built, great player. But he had the the windmill forehand. Mm. And I remember watching him play Borg. Borg had it up so high, but the iMark recorder, um, it's like with the the pilots, the Blue Angels, Vic used to always talk about that when that was one of his new toys. So he gets the iMark recorder and they were teaching the pilots to just look straight ahead. Mm -hmm. And then when they could film where the pilot was looking, they were looking right at the wing, (laughs) right out of the corner of their right eye. I'm watching that guy. Yeah. And, but the eye mark recorder, it looked like Borg had a huge swing on his forehand. Yeah. And even because of how how Borg went back with his elbow first, Mm -hmm. people, people misinterpreted, thought he had an extreme grip and he didn't, but Borg's forehand is shorter, was shorter, is shorter than senior players. It was shorter than Connors. Connors had the racket where he went low, yeah. high, back low. Yeah. And I love Connors. But Connors, he still to this day doesn't think he lost. 1977 U- US Open. It was on clay, Forest Hills. Last year, Forest Hills. For three years, it was on hard true. And the New York crowd, the last point, all the fans from Argentina in New York, they storm on the court like it's a soccer match, mm-hmm. soccer game. 
and they carry Velos off on their shoulders. To this day, Jimmy Connor is a side note. He doesn't think he lost that match. He was down five love <laughs> in the fourth. He doesn't think he lost the match. But when, when it comes down to, um, Vic used to take a string and tie it to the racket. And most the best best forehands are about fifteen feet in length. Mm. But most kids, they don't know it. But the swing is four feet behind their back. Yeah. So it goes four feet too far back, four feet this way. It's eight feet of extra length. Yep. One thing I do when I train coaches is I take the FedEx logo. And in the FedEx logo, there's an arrow. Right. And if once you see it, you always see it. Exactly. So we, we photocopy and we get thirty people. I know you've done those workshops with them. we didn't pass out thirty copies and we've got crayons okay now fill it in you see the arrow fill it in yep and once you see it you'll always see it yeah and if you're playing it you're coaching someone and the racket goes way behind their back yeah and you know that's something that uh pet peeve number you know 9202 <laughs> that's a wta forehand oh now, man don't get me started atp four and wta forehand that's another thing too is, is that all these clinics on how to, how to coach a female I don't get it. When it comes down, you think the women would just say, we don't want any part of that. Yeah. Um, that no, just a, coach the individual. The forehands of forehand. Physics are yeah. physics. I mean, does the ball know where it's being hit by a female or a male? Yeah. Yesterday on uh, our Instagram page at Great Base Tennis, a little plug there, we I put up a video um, from Vic's, Vic Braden's forehand course, and it's you know raising the elbow to help shorten a backswing. And then I put out a, a tweet, and I tagged... Um, Madison Keys and Sloan Stevens, who both have longer swings on the forehand. Like you say, winning is is not just confusing, it's totally confusing. So one, they were both in the final against each other at the US Open a couple of years ago. So one wins and one loses, but they both have longer swings of the forehand. So kids are gonna look at that and go, hey, it's okay to have a long backswing on the forehand, but they don't realize what you just said. Okay, let's say it goes two feet back. Well, it comes forward two feet. So it's actually four feet in length. So it goes the backswing. So it goes the rest of the swing. So it becomes more horizontal, less consistent. They can't stay close to the baseline. So they have to back up to buy time from the, from the baseline and then also in return of serves. And so it's just like where you go, okay, is it okay to have a longer backswing? Yeah, you, you can do anything if you do it enough times, a billion times. But could it be better? Could it be more efficient? Could they have you know, more options to go forward. I saw, I saw, I saw a video clip of Mark Kovacs where he was talking about, it's okay to take a big backswing and yeah, there's no, there's no rule against it. But if you want to win 20 grand slams. Yeah. And Madison Keys is having success. So our, our point of view is not to criticize, you know, Sloan Stevens, she won the U S open. Yeah. I mean, she's a great, great player, but the, the Sloan Stevens of the future. I mean, if she could turn the clock back, you know, we're not saying, oh, she needs to change her forehand. Yeah. But um, with uh, Jim Klein, we mentioned Ryan Reedy, who um, has a two minute, mm -hmm. what's it called? Two, two minute, minute tennis. Two minute tennis. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I worked with Ryan some when he was younger, but he basically, he spent 20 years working with Jim Klein. And Jim Klein wrote a great article on Sloan Stevens, the size of the backswing. Yeah. And, um, you know, today I was watching TV. We need to talk about Jimmy Arias. Just for a minute, and Arias, I, I love to listen to him in the booth. Yeah, he's always, he's always smiling, laughing. I've been on some conference calls with him. I housed his brother one time. We're both from upstate New York, but I, I've never really met Jimmy in person. Um, one of my students had me talk to him two different times on a conference call when he was in college tennis for a while. But what he said about TFO's forehand, it's got a wiggle, and it's got a hitch. <laughs> and again, it's not to criticize TFO. When, yeah. he, when he won the Orange Bowl with Ray Benton, I must have got, like everybody else, like 20 emails. He's going to meet President Obama. And it's great. You know, he won the Orange Bowl, 15 years old. Yeah. But our school of thought would be, well, you've won the Orange Bowl. You've proved you can really win. Maybe six months. Let's take, a, let's take that time off. And with his forehand, um, it's not really a weak stroke until it's pressured. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that the big three are the big three. There's not that many tennis players who can take time and space away from a player. Yeah. With, um, but forehand ground strokes years ago, it was like, okay, I'm going to shake hands on this side and I'm going to shake hands on this side. I'm going to keep a penny on edge mm -hmm. and go all the way through. Yeah. Braden, 
people thought he was radical. You know, it was a revolution where he was telling people to close the racket face, right. like you're dribbling a basketball, tilt it down 30 degrees. Yeah. Because if the racket face is closed, you can use gravity to let the racket free fall. But when yeah. the racket's on edge, you got to recruit the muscle, especially if you let it open up slightly. Yeah. But when we used to teach that, you know, fence to fence, shake hands with a giant, you're teaching a 180 degree swing on a 20 degree court. But one thing about tennis teaching of old is at least people were trying to teach. Yeah. Here's the ready position. Here's the unit turn. Here's the backswing. Here's the contact. Here's yeah. the follow through. And now the game based approach to me, and I might sound cynical, but the game based approach, it should definitely be used, but it has to be combined with form based. Yeah. If you take form based and game based, it's principle based teaching. But with game based teaching is let's make it fun and they'll come back. Mm hmm. You know, I, I think parents would be discouraged to hear this, especially in the U.S., is that, um, and again, I'm a member of the PTR and a member of the USPTA, and I would recommend young coaches in this country to do the same thing, to be associated. But it's a pretty safe bet that when you go to a, a convention, there's more seminars, there's more presentations on how to make money than how to make players. Oh, no, for sure. I mean, I've, one thing I've got written down here, you know, some of the problems that are faced or we come up with in the tennis industry, as far as people just getting along with basic fundamentals is there is no real established philosophy. You know, anything goes, you know, I've got written down here. Is there a PTR forehand, USPTA forehand, USTA forehand? You know, they've got, there's parameters, but the parameters are very loose. You know, so there's not a whole lot of detail there. And then when you get into detail, people will say, well, that's too, too much of a system or that's too fixed or too rigid as far as, you know, lead way. You could as I say, well, wow, there's a Nick Baltieri forehand, NBTA. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what's the name of the place Ray Benton's the general manager of? College Park. College Park. So at one time they had the big three. Uh, they had Mitch, Mitchell, uh, Fr Mitchell Frank, mm -hmm. Junior Ore, and Dennis Kudla. Yeah. And Kudla, Kudla was once asked, because he was hitting with Nadal, it was a great answer. And they said, do you think Nadal is the most mentally tough player of all time. And he goes, no, I think Mitchell Frank is. <laughs> you know, Mitchell Frank, I remember Vic went there. He, he's actually yeah, uh, teaching. He, he's working with some someone that we've worked with. I, I, I know that he's doing some coaching, so he's not not playing. I mean, he he won junior titles. He, he Right away, he won college titles. As a freshman, he wins the All-American. And his forehand, but people weren't pressuring it. Yeah. But anyway, you take those three players and, I mean, I think Junior or, or a re, he rebuilt this game. Yeah, I remember that with, with us. And he was going to be four. He brought his, his grandfather brought him for four days, and he stayed for four months. And mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, Frantangelo had won the French and, and uh, came back. And I mean, obviously, he's not too many players win the Junior French. He's uh, in good company. Um, he beat Dominic Team in the final, mm. but then Junior Ore, you know, took it to him at. Kalamazoo. And I don't know the, you know, maybe uh Frantangelo just stepped off an airplane. He was playing on clay the day before. Um, but Junior was so, so fast. So if they took the speed and then they took the mental toughness of Frank, but Kudla hit the ball really well in comparison to the other two. Yeah. Um, you know, then TFO came out. So to say there should be, I think, uh, like Arthur Ashe said about Welby Van Horn, you could tell one of his students a mile away. Right. There's going to be the strength of the individual. Individuality is always going to come out. Yeah. With Nick Baltieri, I worked for a company that he founded, All American Sports. Now, when I worked for All American Sports, Nick was not there. Nick Baltieri and Harry Hopman worked at the same um, camp, Amherst College, Mass Massachusetts, Amherst, Mass. Ryan Meyer was the camp director. And then I actually, when I was working for the company, I went, I had 10 days because the camp I was at, didn't go as long. And I, I went and volunteered to work at Ryan's camp. It was interesting to ask, so what was it like? Mm -hmm. And, but Nick was in charge of the adults. Um, Nick spent so many years in, in Puerto Rico and he, he, he basically taught adult clinics. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I mean, he brought up uh, Brian Godfrey you know, before he ever went to Puerto Rico. So then he came back to the United States and he started the academy. That's where the word comes from. You never heard the word academy. He saw Jimmy Arias. Got to talk about Jimmy Arias. His forehand. He saw him hitting on a public park in Sarasota. And he said, look at that kid hit a forehand. Mm. 
And uh, Jimmy Arias' father, he worked for Niagara Mohawk, and he taught his son how to hit the ball out of Ed Faulkner's book. Mm. I should be able to tell you the title of his book. We used to have a class of this academic program I ran, Contemporary Literature, for Tennis Instruction. So he, he, we had, you know, we had, the kids could, uh, I think they had to read four assigned books and, and, and read four others. So it was eight books over the 16-week semester. But Jimmy Arias, you know, he, he's good friends with Nick Baltieri, and he t- gives Nick a hard time, needles Nick, because you know, he got to be like five in the world. And he didn't have a backhand grip on the backhand. Yeah. Slight of built. But he, he um, even though he came after, say, Borg, Borg people, people thought of Borg as, you know, you know, what planet did this guy come from? But Jimmy's forehand, um, Nick said, okay, we're just going with strength. Yeah. And then after Jimmy, um, Aaron Krikstein. Right. And he had, you know, he had an extreme grip, but, you know, he's just obviously a, a, really back and low too. Yeah. It, but, um, how much loop, but came where I'm, okay, I'm going to get in this corner. I'm going to hit all four hands. Mm-hmm. And Nick, then, uh, soon after, uh, Jim Courier and Andre Agassi. Now again, um, Krikstein and Agassi were world-class players, but Courier and Agassi took it up a level. And I think they have to thank the, the, the academy students that went before them. Uh, that's generally how a program works. Sure. So um, Andy Roddick is uh, inducted to the Hall of Fame, and he's like, well, I'm glad Jim Courier's here because we both had crappy backhands. Yeah. <laughs> and with, you know, I, I, to digress, Roddick was, um, didn't have a loop, didn't have the racket of pie, and he pulled outside in. Um, did he didn't miss too many balls, but it, it you know, um, I recently hear him say, I've never hit a topspin backhand in my life. Jim's grips, you know, his, uh, his left hand, you know, he had to pull so back in yeah. because of the angle, the racket head. Yeah. But, you know, he named his company after he retired from the ATP circuit inside out. People need to realize that all four hands are inside out. Yeah. You cannot hit topspin if you don't swing inside out. So when you hear a commentator say outside, inside, 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 that's related to the target or to the tactic. Yeah. But swing path. Yeah. It's high, low, high. No, like, like, it, like an anacone was at Boletari's and he was somebody who came in on everything and mm-hmm. um, like everything. <laughs> but yeah. um, so Nick went just with the strengths. So and then what happened too is people weren't even thinking about playing doubles weren't even thinking about playing doubles. Yeah. But I think of Agassi, you know, I mean, you could comment on, uh, you know, Vic Braden started talking about the pre-stretch. Yeah. I, I think that really hurt a lot of tennis teachers and tennis players. No, I mean, I think you could talk about too, Agassi's dad and the 2,500 balls a day, uh, something like that. Off, yeah, off you the, know. Off the ball machine and close to the baseline. And Andre is the youngest of four. It's Rita Phil, Tammy, I think I have it right. <laughs> and Tammy went to Tyler Junior College. I watched her play for a year. I worked at, worked in Tyler, Texas between 81 and 91. So I was running this academic program for tennis teachers and her brother was very nice. I mean, she was there long enough that she had a sports car, went home and came back with another sports car. <laughs> <laughs> with a um, great fighter, she got to the point where she played at A&M. She, great fighter, she overcame cancer. But... You think, okay, for Mike Agassi, I read his book. It's like, well, there was no similarities between yeah. how she hit a ball and how Andre hit a ball. Mm-hmm. But the story is, is that, and I love this story, is that Boletari, excuse me, before he went to Boletari's in Las Vegas, Mike Agassi, he, you know, he came over from Iran. He was in Be- yeah. as a bellman in Chicago. He, Boxer. He uh, is a bellhop and he buys a, a house. But the realer, Mike and the realer are walking up the sidewalk to go to the front door and, and that's, they're going through the front door and the realer says, Mike, let's go through the front door. He goes around back, he measures off the backyard. He never saw the inside of the house. Yeah, That's a man with a plan. Exactly. So then Agassi, that's my, this is my theory on it, is he hit 2,500 balls a day. His dad souped up the machine. Mm-hmm. So out of fatigue, out of survival, yeah. 
he learned how to how to counteract the speed of the incoming ball. Yeah. I don't think anyone uses their legs better than Agassi with forehand and backhand side. Now, I mean, he is definitely going to snap his legs up. That front leg is going to be straight. Yeah. It's going to generate so much force. Unwind lift. And, um, you know, just letting the racket free fall, hitting away from the body. Yeah, no, I remember when Vic was doing the 3D studies um, that I later got involved with as well, digitizing uh, Dr. Gideon Ariels, the biomechanist from Israel, his APAS system. And when he did the 3D with Andre and they would see the pre-stretch when that first kind of started getting uh, out there a little bit, you know, when the forearms going forward, the, the equal and opposite reaction was the wrist laying back. And he showed that to Gil Reyes and Gil was like, whoa, I wasn't even aware that he did that. But so Vic started to show some of that stuff and uh, then things started to get a little dangerous in the tennis teaching world because it's like today. Do you really think Roger Federer was taught, okay, you know, invert the racket, drop it, flip it, pull it, snap it, roll it? Like, no chance. You know, those things, some of those things are going to just happen passively. And because of the speed of the game and all that kind of stuff, the forces involved those things will happen. But if you try to do it, it usually just ends up in a train wreck. Well, we'll come back to pre-stretch, but when it comes down to young players today, I tell them, look at YouTube to be inspired. Yeah. Don't look at YouTube for instruction. <laughs> With Be sure to check out our YouTube channel. <laughs> when, <laughs> when, it, when it comes down to, uh, you know, being a copycat, yeah, you can copy the headband. You can yeah. copy how they pull on their shoulder, how they, you know, shake the wrist right before they serve. But it's difficult to copy, you know, say a forehand. Well, you know, I've told this story before, maybe even on the podcast, but I was with JJ Wolf coaching a couple of years ago. We were at Cincinnati and he had a two hour practice with, with Roger. And so he had this great practice. And then afterwards we talked for quite a while, at least 30 minutes. And Roger was giving some advice and he said, yeah, you want to learn from and copy the best, but he said, I'm a difficult person to copy. And what and did he mean by that? Just, you know, some things that Roger can do, others couldn't do. I mean, the, the way he was raised and all the different sports, and, and I think we've talked about this before, but you just got to be careful what you try to copy. Well, I think also, too, is that is there's definitely he, things Roger can do that not everybody can do, <laughs> even when we talk about brain typing. I mean, some of those things that just how you're wired, not everybody's going to be wired that way. When a youngster is 10 years old and they're looking at Roger when he's, you know, now he's you know, close to 40 years old but, and he's been on top for 20 years. Stage development. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be great for listeners to go, really? Nadal had a two-handed forehand? Right. Uh, you're going to get in a little trouble if you're trying to copy Nadal because, again, that comes back to what you said about you know, the follow-through doesn't exist anymore. It's it's recovery. People misinterpret the recovery as the follow-through. So Federer goes out four and a half feet, tracks outward. Yeah, I mean, so the 3D studies I did with Vic, it's not that the strings are going to face the target for four and a half feet. Right. But, but the, the path of the racket, the tip of the racket travels the length through an alley, you know, out, outward. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an arc. But, but if people could just say, hey, this is how far, there is a linear path, not a straight line, but it's, there's a linear path that goes outward. Yeah, and the forehand, for the forehand four won't go as far as the backhand, one-handed backhand, because the shoulder's going to pinch. Yeah, it's going to pinch. Yeah, the backhand, the backhand was longer. A one-handed backhand, one yeah. One-handed backhand. So but the yeah. pre-stretch. Um, or lag, people you know, lag and snap. But you know, now it's, it's like there is no ready position. If you see people in the ready position in this position, so when they turn, they have no options. Like yeah. Federer, when he turns, he has the option of, of blocking the return. Yeah, especially with the Eastern grip. Dennis Vandermeer, the in relationship of strokes, in relationship of spins. Um, I one time was at the Roddick Tennis Academy training players, and it, the, the question was on a two-handed backhand. So a two-handed backhand, talking about forehands, it's a, it's an for, for Russ righties, it's a left-handed forehand. It's been proven research. I purchased the yeah. muscles in the forearm. So, um, Leo Lavalle was there, Mexican player. And Myron Grunberg was in charge. 
Or so they said, would you help this young junior, a young girl, 15 years old, with a two hand and a backhand? I said, yeah, sure. So I fed her some balls, saw she hit it, and I had her come up to the net. And I said, just turn, straighten out your arm, and just go for it. Like it's a left-handed forehand volley. Coming back to Vandermeer, in relationship with strokes, in relationship with spins. Yeah. The ready position is the volley. The ready position is the backswing for the forehand or backhand. Yeah. And then they, they said, oh, no, no, Steve, we want you here to work with your backhand ground stroke. And I looked at the coach and said, I am. <laughs> uh, you, ha- you have to understand that the movement is so short and compact. Yeah. And I, I like to listen to everybody. I think Oscar Wagner, move your feet, touch the ball. Move your feet, line it up like you're going to touch the ball, but now go under and brush the ball. Yeah. So he says it very simply. Yeah. Uh, but the pre-stretch... You definitely add a segment. It can be a power source. It's like, even like Federer at times. He'll put the racket if, inverted at a 45 degree angle yeah. because now the racket can go faster. Yeah. I think of Yannick Noah doing that, but you certainly can lose some disguise if you hit the racket like this and you're going to hit a drop shot. Yep. Um, you lose options. You're going to run forward and you're going to play a conventional approach volley. Yeah. But Lendl used to skip Wimbledon. And he told people he was allergic to grass, but when he first said that he was <laughs> standing on a golf on course. Golf course, yeah. But he used to do this on the return. Now, Lendl didn't really change it in the rally, but he changed it on the return. So, again, the top players. And just so the listeners know, you're you're pointing the tip of the racket forward. So when the elbow is really raised and it inverts the racket like that. Yeah, if you're in the ready position, the racket's 45 degrees going forward. But if you invert it, it should be 45 degrees back here, but they actually turn it. Agassi, Brad Gilbert said, his backhand is a gift from God. And I remember at the Canadian Open, I guess he was 36, and he was just hitting through Nadal. Hmm. But I guess he couldn't capitalize on a short ball. I mean, he can come in and, and, and go for it. Yeah. And Braden asked him, we have it on tape. He <laughs> said, Andre, you get them so out of court. Yeah. You know, why don't you go to the net? And Andre said, have you seen me <laughs> volley? <laughs> now, Nadal... You know, because he's closer to a forehand grip on this side, he can come in and drive the volley. But yeah. he's got almost a forehand grip on the – he has the same grip on the backhand yeah, side. Yeah, he chops that baby. But the thing is, is that, you know, and Borg used to just, you know, go – he'd go way down on the backhand volley. But um, Nadal is closing in. He's yeah. going to get his nose over that yeah, net. Yeah, he's right on top of the net. Um, so I think when it comes down to young players coming up – are you going to be able to play doubles? Are you going to be able to play all over the court? And don't compare yourself to the pros. I think young juniors coming up, they need to look for every competitive edge possible. And they'll, they'll get defensive and they say, well, um, you know, so-and-so does that. Mm-hmm. So-and-so does that. You know, like say Nadal goes down on his backhand volley. It's interesting when I show, you know, players, juniors, even pros, other players, players in slow motion you see that all those basic checkpoints are there and there may be a few little idiosyncrasies or some different stylistic things the grip changes the angle of the racket face slightly but really just from a physics aspect you know most i'd say 98 percent are doing a loop swing so they're using gravity they get below the ball with the racket face closed they swing inside out the racket's vertical or close to it they extend out to the target and then they finish up higher, you know, than, than the impact point. The tennis is a lifting game. So, but you just see all those basic things in there. And really, you could take any two players and do like a, an editing or something. You could do a little um, ghosting where you put one player over the other. And you're going to see those basic checkpoints are all there. It's almost identical in some way. Uh, something Vic used to do is you go into a stadium you take your program and you roll it up, yeah. you know, like it's a telescope and you just look and say red and you look for red and it's amazing how red will jump out and you go, mm-hmm. okay, now blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's really, it's what you're, it's what you're looking for. And then, you know, it's keep coming back to that FedEx logo. Yep. Um, do they have a clean ready position? Where are they on the unit turn? Yeah. Um, if they're sloppy in the ready position, they're going to have to make some adjustments when they turn. Yeah. There's a kid that I, I like his game. He's he's uh, from Denmark. I've spent a lot of time with Mikhail Torpegard, but this is Holger Rune, and he was the number one ranked junior in the world. And he really overall has really clean strokes on the backhand side. He just turns the racket's at a forty-five, and on the forehand side he does that as well. But 
he kind of has a racket low and then he has to lift it up first and then he turns, but there's no real deviation in his swing. It's just, it's up basically on a 45. He, he prepares quickly, but he does have that extra move coming up before he turns. But then everything after that is just really, really clean. I mean, he's going to do well. One system we use, we say we have a system of systems is Don Leary's word pitcher method mm-hmm. on the forehand, you know, even like using a hula hoop as a teaching aid. The Ferris wheel. Keep your racket in the hula hoop. Yeah. Over the bridge and up the hill. Yeah. Letter C. Yeah. Um, I, I like around the beach ball. But when it comes down to, I just don't understand, <laughs> pull the lawnmower. Pull the cord of the lawnmower. I know yeah. Leighton Hewitt does that when he does his does his pump after, his he, pump. Wins, after he wins a point. Yeah. I don't understand coming here and turning the doorknob. Yeah. You know, by the time you feel the hit, it's really aftershock. The ball's 7 to 11 feet away from you. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting how people are spending so much time on what to do on the follow through. Ball's gone. Yeah, the ball's gone. And then the thing is, is you know, even if, okay, let's say on the follow through or recovery, the forearm pronates and it, it turns over like a windshield wiper, but don't try to do it. Because the problem is if you try to do it, then you end up covering the ball and hitting in the net or pulling the ball wide. If, if I think if more people... Or players understood the dimensions of the court too, how narrow it is, right? Less than 20 degrees, 19.1 from the sideline, 19.6 from the center mark, that they wouldn't try to swing on a horizontal like that so much. Yeah, understand the dimensions of the court, physical laws. All ties in so, together. Yeah, we tell people, okay, point your racket, comes from Braden, point your racket down the line, close your eyes, point cross court. So that's yeah. where you get the 19.1 degrees. So yeah. you don't want to be target oriented, you can be contact oriented. Yeah. So really, um, down the line and cross court, those are not very good terms. You'd be much better off to say center mm. and off center. And, you know, in England, they'll say up the tram lines, like the railroad tracks. The alley is like a sidewalk. And Braden used to always say, it's like you're playing on a sidewalk. Yeah. So the path of the racket, path of the target. So your palm guidance, if you're hitting down the line, bad term. <laughs> Actually, Cole Reeves is a coach we spent a lot of time with. He's corrected me a few times up the line is better than down the line because well, it's a lifting game yeah i think too if you're on the south side of the court then say up the line if you're on the north <laughs> side of the court then say down the line <laughs> but when it comes down to you have the use of terms down the line and cross court that people are so familiar with yeah you have a down the line sidewalk you have a cross court sidewalk exactly when you're a righty and you're on the right side of the baseline if you can hit over the right side of the net ideally you're going to hit through a second story window yeah. You're going to have the shape. You're going to have the trajectory, yeah. the arc. You won't miss wide. Yeah. So to try try to do that, try to miss long, you have a better chance of having the racket face be square at the hit by swinging fast and slow. So you're better off to be a, for a one ball blast and a forever push. Yeah. Um, but to use the alleys, you know, so we have kids drop hit in the alleys. We can make it a contest it's talking about game based. Okay. We're going to keep score. You can have people move up and move down. They're just drop hitting balls in the alley. And they love competition. It's a game. Yep. But the game is forcing them to work on their forehand from a technical standpoint. Yeah. But then they really have to understand the tennis IQ. But what gets in the way of the tennis IQ is, yeah, we've got a young player who's just a first first class kid. And no one would really notice that because he's going to get the sportsmanship award. But when he misses, it's gasoline on the fire. You know, he, we want people to be high negative. Yeah. And Stefan Edberg, he was so competitive. It's, Sportsmanship awards named after him, yeah. ATP circuit. Yeah. But you miss its high negative. You slap yourself on the thigh. It's like, come on. Yeah. So you go from negative instantly to positive. But then you have to go through it and use specific feedback. The spin will tell you if you're any good. You know, we have uh, one player we work with, and Andy walks by and says, "You see any UFOs?" <laughs> Area fifty one and ufos ufos is because the kid's forehand is a flying saucer yeah we work with him work with him and he has two motor programmings one while he's training with us and then one when he plays mm. it's like yeah i've been listening to you guys but i got my own thing going here and he just won a tournament today so winning's confusing but where the racket <laughs> goes this way well one thing with that too is that we're in the development of business we haven't really been in the rec- on the recruiting side of things and to my understanding People tell me this all the time. We're one of the only people on the internet. I don't really like to be an internet guru. <laughs> uh, all our content is free. But when it comes down to um, 
show people how they hit the ball, show pre videos, post yeah. videos. And, um, but you know, if you're, you know, recruiting players, most academies are, are based on recruiting the run on emotion. That's yeah. where, uh, um, I think it was Ryder to heart years ago said we're the anti-academy. Yeah. I mean, with it, you know, he lived in Tampa. We were, I ran a town school for 15 years in Tampa. And I know he would be frustrated. It's like we have this Irish player. He comes in and, you know, he's um, has a higher UTR than the players he's training with. And, you know, we study his game for a few days. And then it's like he's not even getting to play now. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, you know, that's what Braden used to say. Um, I would say it uh, to their face. Vic would be a nice guy to be in the back room. That kid's game. What game? Yeah. He has no game. <laughs> you know, one thing about tennis players years ago, especially before players started hitting two-handed backhands and everybody had a one-handed backhand, is they used to think they had a great forehand because they were comparing it to their backhand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that's going on now is kids are just playing one-dimensional tennis. You know, if you're playing a righty, try to have a move to the right hitting forehand. They're just looking to yeah. hit forehand. So when the point's over, you know, we had that going on today is um, – you know, I've got, like, say, a 15-year-old playing an 11-year-old. So we say it's brawn versus brain. Mm -hmm. Now, in our world, the person who's better is the person who has the higher score on the skills test, not who has the, the winning score on the scoreboard. Yeah. So, you know, they're muscling the ball and they're you know, slapping balls left and right and overpowering the kids and they're thinking they're winning. So, But when, when the point's over, where are you standing? Yeah. Um, playing the ball on the rise – uh, Jimmy Connors, you know, they asked Jimmy, what's your legacy? He goes, I think my legacy is getting people to take the ball on the rise, mm -hmm. just bounce hit, being so aggressive. It was, it looked like he was playing half volleys. He played with high energy, moving his feet. Yeah. Um, you know, when you hear about someone like Mar Martina Hingis, well, she's not practicing many hours. What did she do when she was younger? <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's very dangerous for a young junior to say, Jimmy Connors, well, he only practices 30 minutes, 45 minutes at the most, and he just goes crazy yeah. when he plays. Yeah. But so Jimmy says, my, the legacy of my game is I, I took the ball on the rise. So it was, I think it was great when Agassi asked. So, and this just lets you know that he certainly had an appreciation because he knew what Jimmy had said. Mm -hmm. He said, well, Jimmy Connors said his legacy was taking the ball on the rise. My legacy is taking the ball on the rise and hitting it with top spin. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy wasn't as flat a hitter as people say he was, but in comparison to Agassi, definitely a flatter hitter. Yeah. What about, I've got written down here um, a couple of different things. One, uh, Don Budge and the changes he made. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I don't think you see change very much in tennis. Uh, Especially not on a... Yeah, I go back even before Don Budge. Bill Tilden, his father was a mayor of Philadelphia. He couldn't hit a topspin backhand. He was wealthy enough, and this was unheard of back then, is to have a full-time coach maybe even in that case, a servant tossing you balls and hitting backhands. Um, but Don Budge had a Western grip on his forehand. He won all four, four in 1938. So um, Danny Cooper, who I had worked with as a player and a teacher, he's a lawyer in Montreal now. For the longest time, I mean, five years anyway, he was a, um, the director of the Don Budge tennis camp. And so Don Budge was a gentleman, prince of a guy, and you know, he sees Cooper teaching the backhand side. So you have a loop on the forehand. The ball doesn't know there's being hit by a forehand or backhand. Yeah. Now, you for years, Boletari taught people to take the racket up high on the forehand and, and low on the backhand yeah. because the shoulder housing hits in front and you don't have time. Um, so anyway, Danny was teaching a loop on the backhand, and Don Budge said, what are you doing? This is an amazing story. He <laughs> said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm teaching the racket up high so they can get more racket at speed, same as the forehand. He goes, well, you don't do that on the backhand. You take your thumb to thigh to the sky and <laughs> pull the gun out of the holster and uh, pull the sword out of the sheath. It's, it's pull the gun out of the holster and shoot the man on the balcony. Pull the sword out of the sheath and say, touche. <laughs> um, I've learned more on how not to teach tennis than to teach tennis. Right. So Cooper, uh, he was clever and he said, well, Don, we show that film every Monday. Highlights of Don Budge <laughs> every Monday. And I've been here for a long time. Let's go watch how you hit a backhand. Yeah. So the top players, they don't, Braden is, they don't say what they do or do what they say. Yeah. So Cooper goes in the room with Budge and they, he hooks up the film and he goes, check it out. And here's a guy, you know, won the grand slam. <laughs> and 
And John Budge looks at the film, he goes, son of a gun. <laughs> With, uh, Did he say son of a gun, though? Well, he goes, you're right. <laughs> Did he say something? No, I'm sure he did. Prince of yeah. a guy. Yeah. I think of uh, Gavin Hopper. I was in charge. Dave Anderson joined me right off the bat. Robbie Scoos and Carly Bassett in the Academy. So, you know, he, he, they both retired very early. So a lot of pros is in Boca, Boca Raton. A lot of pros would be there. I remember Wally Masur. What a nice guy. And... Um, so Gavin was just, we hired Gavin to be, because they were coming, they're going to use it as a base. And we hired him to help juniors with fitness. He had his PhD, PhD in exercise technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a Freudian slip. So Gavin says, what do you think of Wally's forehand? And I wasn't really paying attention, but I mean, I was saying, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. If you guys would uh, practice on this court, we want you to practice on this court because it's on the end it's, and it's, there's all this shade. And then we're going to have the juniors are going to come over and have lunch and watch you guys practice. And they, they were all cool with that. Yeah. So Gavin says, Steve, what do you think of uh, Wally's forehand? <laughs> and I look at it and I, I later did film, you know, a lot of times I do film for someone and the, 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 the trainer sees it, but the horse doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Meaning that you, you show the film, but the player never gets to see it. I know that, but uh, so I, I go, well, he takes the racket low twice. Yeah. He goes, what do you mean? <laughs> I go, well, Jimmy Connors does, they'll, they'll feel so too bad. Is that they turn and it's just a rhythm, but the yeah. racket goes down and then they go, have to go back up. So yeah. how do they get the racket down a second time? Yeah. Um, but it's amazing how in tennis players don't go back to basics. Hmm. You know, Roger Federer, and he'll use that line. But he was working with uh, Jose Garris. I've listened to Jose speak like so many Amer people in American tennis. And the one when he was working with uh, Federer, you couldn't hear a pin drop in the room. He's asking all these questions. Or you could hear a pin drop. You could, oh, yes. Thank, thank you. You could hear a pin drop. Thanks. You could hear a pin drop. So, um, he, you know, he, um, he said that he started hand feeding balls. Mm. I mean, I've never, ever stopped tossing balls to kids. But at one point in American tennis, it was like, you don't do that. Yeah, you're insulting people if you toss balls to them on your hand. You have to feed the ball to them. <laughs> so, but Federer, you know, questioned that a little bit. Where you're going to toss me some balls? Yeah. But I think if people went back to how Federer was taught, he was taught with static balance. Yeah. I think, arguably, um, Czechoslovakia. You know, now it's Slovakia in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. And I was only there once in '87 to study tennis. And um, but you know, you just think of. Uh, you know, Drobny, he won Wimbledon in 54, and and the, the Czechs did a good job uh, trying to uh, not be suppressed by the Soviets. And tennis existed in, in Czechoslovakia throughout. And, um, but they would actually teach all these athletes on a football field. And I have all these books upstairs, as you know, and um, Welby Van Horn. Welby Van Horn in a 10 year period on a handful of courts at San Juan, Puerto Rico, he developed more national champions in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it'd be brilliant basics and you know, okay, what's the ready position? Um, you know, you know, what do you do from there? It's slow down, self-evaluate, you know, and check the checkpoints, be, be your own coach when you miss, you know, why you missed. Yeah. I mean, we talked a little bit about you know, some of the old school, forehand stuff and then you know for for me Vic came around and he's like okay you know loop swings and closing the racket face um you know modern forehand just some technical terms I mean to keep things simple for listeners at home as well I don't say why listeners at home you could be in your car right now listening I don't know where you are but for the listeners running you know, out working on fitness headset yeah, exactly. on um you know I've got some terms here just okay high low high would be one yeah, the ready position, leave it alone and just turn. Yeah. Peter Burwash, I love to listen to Peter teach or and talk about tennis. So I go way back. He's a little older than I am. As I haven't said, take your racket back since 1964. <laughs> but people would be told, take your racket back, but it's leave the racket alone. It's the same thing when you teach someone to serve. Just put your hands right here and initially just turn your body. Yeah. Uh, Braden used to say for the longest time, the biggest problem in tennis 
is getting the racket below the ball. People don't get the racket below yeah, the ball. Number one error. But then what he said towards the end of his career, he, he was saying, you've got to let the other person think they're going to lose. Just the way you walk around the net post. Yeah. Uh, that expression, get inside their head. Because as you know, when they start making decisions in a different part of the brain, they lose coordination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got inside out, gravity, free fall. That's huge. That's coming back to say um, Jimmy Arias. The scrawny kid, just letting that racket free fall. Yeah. And his forehand was so much better than everyone's. But coming back for Del the Potro. long- Del Potro would be somebody that you could look at today. Yeah, now Del Potro it comes down to, um, I didn't work with Nathan Zeter, but like a four day program I ran for the University of Illinois, but I worked with his younger brother, um, Evan. Evan. And John Zeter is as tall as the house. I mean, he's bigger than both his kids. And you would think that, okay, I'm going to teach these kids to go forward. <laughs> the portrait, you know, he could, he could be more, much more acrobatic at the net. But yeah. his forehand, uh, people think because why well, he's so big, it's a long lever perhaps. But it, it's, you know, I mean, people would be so much better off with the eastern forehand grip. Yeah. Look at Steffi Graf. I mean, Chris Everett went 125 matches in a row. You know, and granted, she could play a side spin forehand. Um, the, the people that commit to um, a too extreme a grip, lots of problems in relationship with strokes, yeah. variety, disguise. Yeah. Sampras too, Eastern. Now Sampras, when he was a little kid, we have film of Sampras when he was a little kid. Yeah. Now he's somebody, as he got older, he started to take his elbow back this yeah. way. As great as his serve was, the pros uh, for two or three years running, they voted his forehand to be the best. I heard Elliot Telcher say one time that, that he used to just kind of, you know, hang over here or just, he was just baiting you. He'd, he'd, he'd get over the back of his side. He was just baiting you to hit to his forehand side. Yeah. I think of Andre Agassi for me, clean. Um, you know, some of the big forehands. I think um, Gonzalez, you know, huge, yeah. huge forehand. Well, one thing about Gonzalez, I think, I mean, I like the character of tennis. I love to study the character of tennis, just to listen to the little nuggets. This week, I, these podcasts, I mean, we have a podcast now. Um, we're a drop in the ocean, Andy. There's so much content out there. But I heard even Nisha Fish say about Nikki Peelich. He said, even Nisha said, there's four guys from the same street I grew up on that were top 10 in the world. And he goes, working with Nikki Peelich. You didn't get to sit out. And you get, didn't get to drink water. <laughs> um, but yeah, great forehands. Um, with uh, you know, a great drill, Agassi, when he came on the, on the scene, it was taboo to play a swing volley. Mm. I mean, I haven't taught 50 years, but pretty close. But I've been teaching tennis six decades. Now, you go back to the very beginning, I was just a volunteer. You are all Yeah. I'm but sorry. Agassi, used to, he didn't have a volley. He didn't have a conventional volley. He just was radical. And then they named the racket he used radical. Yeah. He would just come in and play a swing volley. If you want people to hit the ball well, I think Harry Hopman and uh, Robert Landstorp, how they would feed. Mm. You can't, and, you know, Vic would just feather the ball, put the racket here. Yeah. He's called it the rapid fire. There's a lot of, you know, bum, bum, bum. you pump out balls, but he would just feather and he, Vic would feed the ball very low. It would come in and just, there'd be nothing on it. And yeah. it would get, get the person to get way below the ball. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't feed the ball well for a Welby Van Horn, I mean, it was like, I tell, I tell kids all the time, you miss one get ball in the here. net. You just miss one ball in the net. Everybody's sitting out for 30 minutes and it's just like, sit it out, get over here. What are you doing? Um, but with, um, yeah, um, forehands, you know, you have to work on all the shots. You need to have a conventional volley. Most people only play swing volley because when they wait, the racket's like this. So you, yeah. you can tell before the match even starts. The kid's waiting like this. Again, he's just showing the... Uh for the listeners at home, jogging, working out, but showing but the, the racket face down but to the, the ground. But to have a kid take the ball out of the air with, um, do, when you have kids drop hit a ball, instead of having it bounce on the ground. Yeah. Now we even tell the kids turn, let the ball bounce two th times, three times. So yeah. they start getting the feeling. You know, kids, young kids don't trust that the ball is going to go over the net. You tell someone to push the racket face down, that doesn't make sense. Right. So they're always scooping like this because, right. oh, that, I'm going to get the ball to go over the net. Yeah. And then for me, it's you watch some young kid and it's like fingernails across the blackboard because you know, uh-oh, the motor programming yep. 
you're going to have to, you know, you have to work so hard. People ask me when I watch a match, who are you for? And I usually am cheering for the person that will help out tennis teachers the most. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, fed. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, there's a guy, um, you know, he, you know, well, Rinka's a great player too, but they, you know, they're not playing doubles, but they show up and they win, uh, they win Olympic gold. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Federer, I, I know there's been a lot of talk and I've gotten a few questions online before about us, you know, the straight arm versus the double bend or bent arm on the forehand. And, you know, there's a few players out there whose arms are fairly straight at contact, but even Federer, I mean, there's plenty of times where his arm has a bend in it, um, but they, they do get pretty far away from the ball and the arm's straight and the contact point is pretty far in front. It's almost really at the end of the hitting zone. And then if he's quick with his forearm, you know, I watched a match once, um, I think it was against Kanyas at Indian Wells, and he had over 30 unforced errors on his forehand. So the forehand starts to spray as well. You know, if you're too, you don't want to be too rigid with your arm. So it's not, you that's know, for the year, are, that's the year he lost back to back. He went yeah, to Miami. Yeah, I, I was in Miami. Kanyas, two weeks, like that's six when, and six. That's when Federer was playing so well. I was in Miami when he lost, and it was like, people just couldn't believe it. Yeah. But Federer, two, one, two. Kitsch initially turned with two hands on the racket, now, granted, we're saying really tiny tykes hit two-handed. Yeah. But they progress, and you go two, one, two. When Feder warms up, he's just hitting down the middle. He's two, one, two. Now, he hits the ball so far away from his body, but he honors the same principle. He's not catching the racket. But I think it's another thing. when um, You're looking at one photo, and you're, you're interpreting that. Yeah. Um, but, again... I guess my point was, I mean, for the the bend versus the straight arm, I, w I wouldn't try to tell somebody to have a straight arm because they're going to end up being rigid. Well, when you turn, you have the racket face closed. If you if you straighten your arm out, it's right here, the camera. So I'm here like this, but I straighten my arm out. Now the racket, racket face is not open. closed. Yeah. Um, you're going to lengthen your arm out ideally as you go out towards the contact point. But for pre prevention of injury on the forehand side, you don't hyperextend your arm. Your arm's not going to be tight. It's not going to be locked. Right. And that's where I think people, when they look at those pictures, I think straight arm, they really try to lock it out. But I, I think what happens is the modern game, okay, someone's 25 years old. They've been teaching tennis for three years. And I don't think they're even teaching out of a magazine. They're just teaching from, at a tournament, there's two types of talk. Fact finding and chit chat fact finding and bleacher talk hmm. and in tennis and again i like to listen to the commentators in many ways but the commentators they need a lot of work on the nuts and bolts you know we're, we're hiring former players they haven't done the trench work yeah and you know all you have to do is you know they they just have a few seconds in between points you know to make make a comment and then afterwards you know when it's in between a match, okay, well, here's this player's plus column, here's this player's minus column. It's interesting, but really, it's not that fact finding. And in tennis analytics, they're throwing that back. Bill Jacobs in 82, um, he founded CT120, CompuTennis, and then he um, did very well with television. It's interesting. He never sold more than 200 computers. And then when he got to the point where you could chart on paper, then feed it into a, a PC at home. Mm -hmm. He, he sold a little over a thousand. He, he gave a couple of computers, laptop computers to some elite coaches. They never learned to turn it on. <laughs> but with analytics, um, when it comes down to Craig O'Shaughnessy, see the first four shots. Now it's great that he's bringing stats to the forefront. I said that earlier, he's on, on TV, mm -hmm. but the, the real analytics is okay. Let's measure the angle of the racket face, the grip. Yeah. And then, you know, do, how does the racket get below the ball? Yeah. You know, how far does it go away? And then, you know, what are the reasons that they get RPMs? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, grip, swing, body. Right. Um, you know, granted on the toss, we had one more component. Yeah, I've a few things left here. You know, other comments. The modern four with the modern forehand, or now some people are saying the next-gen forehand. I remember Matt Clore some months ago sent me a video and it was a, like a kid's toy and it was like flip it pop it roll it smack it turn it spin it and it was like yeah that's that's how people describe the modern forehand now but i know oftentimes we describe it as a lot of these forehands 
look like a snake going into a hole. You know, I think of someone like a TFO with areas. Uh, it's got a wiggle and a hitch. It's got a wiggle and a hitch. It's a little bit like that. You know, it's unfortunate that. But he has it programmed and people really yeah. are not saying, okay, let's see you really do that under pressure. Yeah. And plus now all the surfaces are playing pretty much the same. It's not like you're going from the red clay to the old grass. Yeah. Um, I think with drills, I like this. I went to the Spanish school a couple of times um, over in Naples, Florida. So, um, Emilio Sanchez. So you come in and you hit a volley and then you jog backwards, move backwards quickly. And then you hit a forehand. You could take kids say, okay, take a ball. I want you to walk backwards and drop, hit the ball. You know, I think also to give people a target. Yeah. If you say, okay, get rid of the, get rid of the racket for a minute. Just come up close to the net. Vic used to do this and take your palm. You know, you, you want to have a fixed wrist. Yep. You know, that's one thing we've put up over 10 years, we put up a daily post on Facebook. And I one time said, I apologize. I was wrong. Yeah. You, you, you don't play the, on the forehand side with a fixed wrist. Well, and I think that's too, just quickly where will the wrist go back? Will it extend when the forearm goes forward? Yeah. But don't, don't try to do it. You know, where it's just some of those movements with the wrist or the forearm, they're going to be passive. Yeah, it's like, not, it's like, it's like, like don't try to jump. You're going to uncoil off exactly. the ground. But with this Facebook post, so then people go to the video and it's just ultra slow motion. Yeah. Um, and because, you know, the wrist is a radial point. The racket, yeah. he'll go everywhere. Yeah. Um, you want to be loose. You be really loose in your arm. Most people, we do this daily, is that they hang on to the racket so tight. You come up, you pull the racket. And they, they, it's like <laughs> you're, you pull it's, them. Like, it's like you're, you're the motorboat and they're the water skier. They, they just come <laughs> right with you. And, um, but drills on the forehand, not John Newcomb. One thing they used to do at his academy is play inside the baseline. Don't back up, play the ball on the rise Yeah, with have people and the kids have fun with it. It's a burr wash drill. Uh, so two players, they start off on the service line and you go back a little bit and you each have a ball and say, ready, go. And then you rally two balls at one time. Yeah. Um, if, if you try to hit the ball hard, you won't hit it right. If you try to hit the ball right, you'll be able to hit it hard. Hit it hard. Yeah. Um, it's effortless effort. Yeah. Um, that's where a lot of the top players, they started when they were young. They didn't have any muscles to begin with, so they couldn't muscle the ball. Yeah. Pete Sampras on his son, uh, Christian, he was asked years ago, if you could tell your son one thing, if he was taking up tennis, what would it be? Um, he said, I haven't played with a wooden racket. Yeah. You know, people go out and play with a wooden racket. I mean, it feels like boing, oing, 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 oing. <laughs> So then it's not a very forgiving hit. The, the better the racket, you know, the sloppier you can be. Yeah. Um, granted that doesn't apply all the way to the pros um welby van horn i mean he used to be able to beat kids with his old dunlight max play with no strings and he would just hit on the throat of the racket but you know you just take three strings or four strings the the the, the you go the downs and the ups the cross and you don't string the entire racket face yeah if you actually take some rackets out and toss balls to kids where there's no strings in the racket so i'm going to toss you some balls and then you just go like this because uh, Lenny Schloss with the Billy G King eye coach, that yeah. flyaway ball, they're so mesmerized by what happened to the ball. So we'll get rid of the strings. We'll toss you some balls. Yeah. Um, a great drill is the feed a kid a forehand and um, say, miss the first one and yeah. hit the second one. Just go right underneath it. Yeah. And then you gradually feed faster. Yeah. And they have to just go like this. Um, you know, the simpler, the better. Right. But the swing it, again, it needs to be vertical. If it, if the swing is going this way, the body's the leader. Mm -hmm. So people get all uptight. You know, we tell parents, don't climb the fence. If you're the parent, you need to be the furthest parent from the fence. <laughs> kids, kids are so stressed out about winning. It's, it's really, you really, when it comes down to it, winning is a byproduct of skills. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that comes from my hockey background where you got to learn to skate, kid. Yeah. You know, you work and you're in the, the tykes and the mites and the mosquitoes. And, you know, they think anything that's small. And you finally, you're, you know, 11, 12 years old, you get to be a peewee. But in tennis, oh, no, you're high performance. <laughs> you're elite. Yeah. I'm a high performance coach. And, um, but targets, Dennis Vandermeer, three people. You got a hitter, uh, you got a feeder, and you got a spotter. And the spotter just puts 10 balls, you know, put them on the racket or they hug the 10 balls this way. And so player A feeds to player B. Play, and they put, it, put a cone down. Say, you're getting 10 forehands. 
and you have to hit to the cone and then the spotter puts them down and people yeah. can't get close to no, the target yeah. um you know we uh use the tire the, the targets the tiebreaker test mm -hmm. say okay kid so if they have to get cross court into a quadrant let's see if you can get the target uh it's 18 by 13 and a half just on the forehand ground stroke yeah we're gonna feed it to you it, it, we, we, you've heard us say it's that. a forehand it's coming and but then you know how many can you get out of 10. i think parents should have their child teach them go out and be partners teaching is information transfer should mm -hmm. teach should treat teach everyone to teach and you know said if you want to have someone say okay tell me how you hit a forehand and because if they can't tell you they haven't learned right so then the parent as many times they try to be a technician and they're not to say okay let's do what they said <laughs> you feed me 10 i'll feed you 10. Mm -hmm. that's one thing about kids who go out and shoot baskets in a driveway they, they know okay i got that in yeah and then they play that game where it's horse or pig you know okay right. if you don't make this shot i make this shot you miss it you're a pee mm -hmm. um target tennis um consistency the length of the hitting zone yeah that, that must be in the, your notes um it's about the width of your shoulders we film people and say, why do you film? Well, the number one reason I film is no one's going to come back and say, you ruined my game. <laughs> come back at what game? <laughs> We've got the written file. We've got the video file. They filled out a form and said, I want to play at Stanford. I want to be number one in the world. And it's yeah. all great. But we fed, we fed you 25 balls. You made 10. Yeah. You're 40%. Mm -hmm. Tiebreaker test, you were 1707. There's some work to do. <laughs> we filmed you. And we got this column, this, this column for winners. We got this column for unforced errors. Yeah. And um, even if you just make a cluster chart, you take a red pen, it looks like you had a nosebleed. You know, <laughs> kids, if they were Paper just, cut. if they were just a miss long, I always tell people, if you watch a match and the person you're coaching loses six, three, six, three, if they will listen to you, they can win the next time they play that person. Um, you know, you have to slow down with kids and go, okay, do you know what a felony is? Mm. You know what a misdemeanor is? Your parents got a traffic ticket. They were going 10 miles an hour too fast. They're not going to jail. But in tennis, if you miss long, it's a misdemeanor. If you're in the red zone, and then you miss wide. You're playing somebody, yeah. you throw up a high arcing ball, and they start running back to the fence. How could you lose? Yeah. They're going the wrong way. <laughs> and... You know, and they're not coming in that to pick up balls or shake hands. So, okay, I'm just going to rally. Yep. But, you know, what happens is most kids, they want to hit the ball too hard. They watch tennis on TV, the camera shooting from up above, looking yeah. down, and they don't realize how high the pros. I know, when, why don't you tell the listeners, you've mentioned it briefly, when you're at ground level. Yeah. The no, film. I've filmed for 10 years at Indian Wells. Vic and I had three cameras on stadium court. I um, spent a lot of time with... Uh, Warren Pretorius there as well, a few years. He was down there filming also. But um, yeah, from, from really absolutely ground level. So your eyes would be at the same level as the court because there's a little back area. Actually, John Yendell used to be hanging out back there as well. Um, but there's just little cubby holes that you could look out, but you'd be really at feet level. And so you could really get some film and, and then see how high over the net they're hitting. I've got a lot of footage, but... Got to figure out a way to get people to see that the the myth, but it's just every time you just see it, it's three feet, five feet, eight feet. I mean, it's yeah, they lift. I yeah. mean, we always tell people think of the tennis ball; it doesn't weigh two ounces; it weighs five pounds. Think of it as a small medicine ball. Okay. You have to lift up. It's a lifting game. With, of course, with a two ounce ball, you can kind of slap it around a little bit, um, but you really need to be up on both toes you've lifted so much you want to feel like your follow-through is taking you right up off the ground yeah so that myth of stay down you stay down with your eyes and your head yeah but not you know another myth come over the ball mm. you know if my fist is the tennis ball come over it that means the ball is going to come up through the strings to go over the net yeah um you could tell people you know if they have an open racket face a little kid like this well you get the feeling that you're coming over the ball yeah just, but, that's not what happens but you know you, you only use that just for a few seconds, you know, if you a minute or two to, uh, but you know, you don't, you're not, you just, your fingertips, if so, a kid's going to drop a ball and hit it with their palm, you can have people go out and try to rally with their palm. And it, I think really, if you can make anything that you can do to make a tournament, we teach tweeners. Yeah. We got all these clever, uh, 
progressions to teach people very quickly to clean the tweener. I mean, I've done so many traveling clinics and um, maybe I'm, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I look around and go, okay, who do I think is the most uncoordinated person here? And I'll have them come out and I'll go, I'm going to try to teach this guy the tweener. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it, it can be done. But it has to be very controlled, though. But they're only hitting it where you toss it, and it's got to bounce five times and four times and three times. Yeah. But other words for practice, it needs to be rehearsed. It needs to be repeated. Mm -hmm. You need to own it. Um, I think one thing on forehands is people spend too much time teaching the forehand. They go out and they start with the forehand, forehand first, yeah. and it's a one-hour lesson or a 90-minute workout. And they just get, get it going, and they're always starting with the forehand. Yeah. Um, with, uh, but no, I, um, what else do you want to talk about? Forehand, no, I, forehand, forehand. I think we've covered a lot. It, for me, just to recap, I think for the listeners at home, and if you were talking about anything just technical, but the forehand ground stroke to try to make it as simple as possible, ready position, um, center of the racket, try to have a ready position where you're going to have options. And then keep the, the turn simple where you don't have a bunch of extra moves going on, all the deviation that you see on a lot of forehands these days. But to make it simple, you got to get below the ball. You gotta, you're going to swing inside out, try to have a tracking motion out to the target. You know, so a long finish or extending out, like we talked about Federer through with the length of an alley. Um, and then relax on the finish, but just to keep it basic and simple like you know, that the australians uh, no worries mate relaxation skills are as important as racket skills yeah be loose yeah now we get criticized of our players looking mechanical mm -hmm. we use the bradenism we let them loosen up after they win nationals yeah but you have to go through that in the beginning it's like with a yeah. follow-through you just had a young boy here to be filmed the first time and um you know that's what we do and someone comes in the first time and we're teaching him to stop up here right slow down yeah. actually stop you stop at the top and you could check the wrist position. Are they relaxed in the swing from the elbow? Because he had the windshield wiper going. Right. And it wasn't raining. He had no hit hitting zone. I mean, yeah. Pros was, that do a windshield wiper towards at the end, they have a hitting zone. They've learned to go out through yeah. the ball. But also, too, they're, the same example, they're taking their left elbow to pull the right hip. And exactly. that's, that's the recovery. Exactly. But, um, but so then when you really swing fast, the racket disappears. Yeah. Um, I know Lansdorp will call it the reverse forehand now. Mm -hmm. You know, Vandermeer used to use the progression to teach people topspin lob, touch your back. Bug your whip. Um, when you watch forehands, you'll see more forehands. You're watching the US Open. You're going to see more forehands where the racket goes like this yeah. than where the racket goes like this. thing is, even with those buggy whip, like a, like a Nadal, I remember doing the 3D with Nadal. He's going way out to the target. And then and then brings it back over his head. So that's the other thing. He's not he's not just going straight up. He's going out to the target and then up. Passing shots on a forehand, approach shots. When you hit an approach shot, say for example, the court's seventy eight feet long. Now you come in for the sake of simple math, you come in eight feet. So you got seventy feet to ball, get the ball up and down. Mm -hmm. You really have to keep your eyes at the you can't pull. Because yeah. once you pull, you lose the vertical lift, and you need more spin when you're hitting topspin approach shot because you have less court to hit into. Yeah. Passing shots, it's it's amazing when people, they, they know that they want to get the ball, and they see their target through the net, they think mm -hmm. they want to dip it, and they, they're going yeah. like this. Yeah. And it's like you can hit an off base passing shot, <laughs> and you can win on the second passing shot. I think one thing to say about forehands is Jack Sock. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I've never coached tennis singer, but I was with a – I, for four tournaments, I think, a month with Austin Krychek. And he wins his tournament. In the semis, he's playing Jack Sock. And Jack Sock was not really a happy camper when he was at a Futures or a Challenger. You could just tell he didn't want to be there. Hmm. And I remember saying, it was so smart. I go, it was I told him it was great how you hung in there when he was tanking. And Sanger said, he plays the same way, whether, he's, whether the match is on the line and he's fighting or he's tanking, he plays the same way. Yeah. Jack Sock, and hats off to Jack Sock, where he's won um, so many doubles titles. Yeah. Big, big serve, great competitor. He won 80 matches in a row in high school. Top 10 in the world. But he, he never um, never played above his age group. That kid learned how to win. Mm -hmm. Parents should learn from that. He, he played high school tennis. He, play, he didn't jump out of his age group. 
So he, obviously a big serve, great competitor. I always tell people, he looks like he, he's from Nebraska. He looks like he could play safety for Nebraska. Mm. But Jack Sock is easier to copy than Roger Federer. And if you were to ask Jack Sock now, and he, he's obviously made a lot of money, but would you rather have Federer's bank account or would you rather have yours? <laughs> and I think that would stop the argument. Okay, I'd rather hit the ball like Federer. Mm -hmm. But way back when, um, you know, what was the beginning? You know, and I think where, you know, he, he was a raw talent and he obviously was not taught refined tennis. Um, and, but, you know, then we say, okay, and you investigate and you ask Sock and he's been asked, he loved Roddick. He loved Roddick. And, yeah. you know, what did Agassi say about Roddick's forehand? Well, you know, he said about a serve, I would die for a serve because he said, oh, I get no free points. I love to say, what do the pros say? Yeah. And with, um, um, when it comes down to. Um, what Agassi said about Roddick. Roddick. He goes, no, it's forehand. Thanks. Senior moment. Right. What, what he, I'm the, here for the, you. With, <laughs> what he said about his forehand is it, uh, it takes him too long to get in the pocket. It's too complicated. And that's that extra segment. You know, you go up real high with the elbow like that. Yeah, it's that extra yeah, segment. But Roddick uh, takes he, time. Roddick, he came up, you know. My, my thought on Roddick is that, you know, you think of it, Jeremy Wurtzman and PJ Domino had wins over Roddick, two people I worked with, and American and South African. So Roddick was fortunate that Andre Agassi started dating Steffi Graf. Steffi Graf lived in Boca Raton. Andy Roddick is one of the best juniors in Boca Raton. Marty Fish was there. So there's a few good, really junior, really good juniors. So now he's practicing with Agassi. He's taking sets from Agassi. Next thing you know, he wins the Orange Bowl and the Eddie Herr. Then right after that, he beat, my point is he beat Sampras in Miami. Yeah. And Sampras said, I'll beat him when it counts. Yeah. But he, but he had, you know, Sampras got a chance to get a look at his game. Hmm. You know, great competitor, huge serve, and he was looking to rip forehands. Yeah. Um, but coming back to Jack Sock, Jack Sock is so powerful that, you know, kids will copy kids. Yeah. And that that was his, you know, he said that many times that Roddick was his role model. Yep. No, that's, that's the thing you see today. I mean, um, kids are going to copy their heroes. But people also, instant gratification comes into it. So I think, I think that's where, you know, we have, I'd say, uh, one of our coaches called our place uh, a stage for our online content. Yeah. But, you know, we're not finished, but we're putting up basketball. We've got soccer. We're going to put up a trampoline, an outdoor fitness, make yeah. kids athletes, got bicycles to ride. And, yeah. and um, but when it comes down to, you got, you got to find a way to temper it. Like, okay, coaches would be better off saying, okay, come on out here, CrossFit, cross trading, multi multiple sports. We're going to take our time taking our time. We develop better players in America where kids played a different sport every season. Mm -hmm. We developed better players in America where kids only took a private lesson. Yeah. And then they would do baskets and play mini tennis for Mountain Dews or whatever. <laughs> um, but kids are allowed to play this one dimensional tennis. You, you can go to a tournament, be there for the three days, junior weekend tournament, and count on your fingers how many volleys you hit, how many over his, you see yeah. hit. Um, the, uh, but I think a lot of times kids think their forehand is a weapon and they've got usually the wrong grip. They've got, you know, the wrong inefficient grip, inefficient swing. The body is flying everywhere. They're totally off balance after they hit it, yep. but they're winning. And usually they're winning just because, okay, they started earlier. Yeah. They're more aggressive. Maybe they had a stage parent. They've they're been pushed stronger, a little bit. A little, yeah. A little more mature. Uh, just, just out of the gate, the early start. Yeah. Um, with, um, you know, so many things like, okay, I'm going to toss you a ball and see how you end up afterwards. And again, that center of gravity. Yeah. Simple balance, Vince Lombardi, be brilliant with basics. And it comes back to the, what we call what we're doing is the great base yeah. is, um, the sooner, the better is that, okay. In the beginning, it's just like academics. I mean, I can't really speak about, you know, piano. Um, but say for example, if someone's a dentist, um, this college I worked at, first college I worked at, late Eugene Allen is the person who made it happen for, for me to create, redesign a tennis teaching curriculum. It, it was a general recreation curriculum. So he was a dentist, but he's also president board of trustees. 
and I was 26. I, I didn't know how much power he had. He was in charge of the president. But, you know, when someone's learning to be a dental hygienist, it's like, okay, how are you going to hang on to this instrument? And are they, are they going to train you? If someone's going to learn how to hang on to the violin, I always tell people, well, you're going to play the piano. I think your hands are going to go this way, yeah. not this yeah. way. Yeah. But common sense is not common. And, um, you know, I really think that parents so many times, consumer knowledge, they don't have it. The product knowledge, that's, that's not there either with a coach. But there's this street hustle. And it's really? Did you do did, did that? Like that, you you know. Uh, what you said earlier is that, well, if that's how a snake goes down a hole, I, I would agree with that. But to be able to consistently hit a forehand to the target on the run. Under pressure. And one thing with pressure is that, uh, this should be my last comment, is pressure really in the end is self-inflicted pressure. Hmm. And you know, Braid used to do this. It was great. Um, Borg and Connors. Connors used to reset on the forehand side. You had the little rocking chair going. Yeah, backhand was better because it was it was more efficient. And he would say, you know, Jimmy knows his forehand's weak, so Jimmy knows. <laughs> Borg knows. Uh, Borg knows that Jimmy knows. Jimmy knows that Borg knows. Yeah. Everybody knows <laughs> he's weak on the forehand side. But then, do they know why they're weak? Why they're weak? And. Um, yeah, you know, you asked about Don Budge, you know, when, when it comes down to um, people making changes in their game, if you have to change a grip, it's quite difficult. And, um, you know, parents of young children, grip of a lifetime. Yeah. So you don't have to go backwards. You don't have to unlearn. That just reminded me quickly before we end, um, we were, David Ramos was out here recently someone I've known for a long time and uh, he does the video work, the analytics for the USTA, but he was out here checking out her place and we'll have them out here again. But um, we were talking about Kathy Rinaldi because they're neighbors and they hit. And then you would. You I'm an old guy. Them. Yeah. You are an old guy, man. I remember being in a match with Andy Brandy in Dallas and we're watching Kathy Rinaldi. She's a pro. And Andy said, don't touch your nose. Because when you're in the booth, the booth's <laughs> going to be, and, you, know, you know, so many times the booth goes and yeah. the person, the person's <laughs> exactly. like, got their hand to their nose but frank froling he recently passed away he was a great guy i mean he's his ba amazing amazing player mm -hmm. with great credentials davis copper the whole nine yards so he got in the resurfacing business and he wouldn't hit a ball and then he'd show up at these men's opens so we got a chance to be you know i say we as english player i played with for a long time we hung around with frank froling so i was watching frank froling more than one time, he was giving Kathy Rinaldi lessons in Delray Beach. And it's it's where they have the tournament now. But at that time, um, it wasn't the stadium it is today, the facility is today. Mm -hmm. So I'm a newbie. I'm uh, uh, switching from being an ice hockey player, going to tr try to, you know, find a way to make a, a living in tennis and become a tennis teacher, tennis coach. So I'm watching Froling work with Kathy Rinaldi. So David Ramos. He said that he hits with her a couple of evenings a yeah. week. She's running the Fed Cup. She's in charge of women's tennis. Yeah. So years later, I mean, Denny Rinaldi, he's always called me for advice on his son, uh, Michael Rinaldi. So Kathy pushes the palm down. She's, she's 11 years old in, in the 12s, and she's lifting up like this. But he's teaching her penny on edge. Yeah. You know, shake hands at 180 degree swing. And then I'm watching him hit, and I'm watching her hit. And um, it, that was right around the time, 1977, Vic Braden's book came out, Tennis yeah. for the Future. And it's fact-based. You, know, you, have, you have to know the dimensions of the court. Yep. And if you don't, you're, you, know, how, you, know, you have to know the racket, the angles of the racket head. And then you, you have to know, it, to me, it's just so basic, is that if the racket's this way, the shoulder can be loose. Yeah. The shoulder can be loose. Now you can let the racket free fall. If you let the racket free fall, you're generating your racket hit speed. Yeah. And then now when the racket face is loose, I should say the, the arm, the shoulder is loose. And now you go out way away from your body. And then you're going to hit true top. Yeah. Very few people hit true top. Yeah. You go to a junior tournament, you look around and go, nope. <laughs> you, nope. UFOs. You know, yeah, the UFO is going like this. And then there's all this emotion. And it's like mom and dad. 
You know, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom here, Mr. Pessimistic, but your kid is not hitting a trifle of topspin. Yeah. It's not going to work. Yeah. Um, but then you, you, tell, you ask the kid, why do you, you know, how are you going to hit topspin? If they sneak a peek, okay, they're all stressed out and they're worried about their opponent. Now, Melody Braden used to tell Vic, don't do this. Vic used to take his finger and pretend he's picking his nose and say, your opponent's really doing this. Opponent awareness. Forget about your opponent. It's like playing chess. Just play the board. Play the court. Yeah. And when it comes down to, um, don't worry. There's only Bradenism. Don't worry. There's only one ball. And it's you on your it. side of the net. Yeah, you and it. you have it. <laughs> so you better take care of it. Yeah. You know, and I, I really appreciate uh, Tim Galloway's book, The Inner Game of Tennis. And uh, Vic, and, and he didn't, you know, he was so nice, but he didn't, you know, he certainly respected Gal- Galloway, but you know, he would say, it doesn't work for me. Pretend you're the ball. Bounce hit, bounce hit. And Vic, if you, it's, you know, I learned this from Vandermeer. If you put a smile on your face, not that I do that very often, but you can say anything you want. Yeah. And, and Vic would say, just shut up and tell me how to hit it. <laughs> and that's where, um, again, beginners, beginners get beginner instructors. A lot of the more experienced instructors uh, Julian Krinsky, great guy. He said, well, I coached some pro tennis for a little bit. He goes, he takes the racket, he hugs it, he stands like this, and he goes, didn't work for me. <laughs> Wasn't exciting enough. But most, a lot of times the guys on the tour, um, Craig Carden said about coaching world team tennis, and some, some true, it's some truth to this in coaching pro tennis. You got to talk all day and say nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a pretty tough sell to sell someone, to tell someone, like this Irish intern we have here. Well, you've been hitting your back end volley this way for 10 years. And he looked at me, he goes, 12. Yeah. And I said, you know, why do you just, you got to go back and you know, take time off away from competition. He goes, well, you know, if, with this pandemic, I've got the spring season coming up. I go, you got to be a good teammate. But when it comes down to, you know, the Braden is, is would you throw up a grenade and run underneath it? <laughs> and, you know, is your forehand the same thing with your serve? Is it a pea shooter or is it a bazooka? Yeah. You know? It's like the movie City Slickers when he goes, it's a duo. Your life's a do-over. <laughs> a do-over. Your, your backhand volley is a do-over. John Wooden, if you don't do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it again? Yeah. And boring. Uh, this is boring. I read recently, if a kid tells you it's boring, just tell them they're, the, tell them that they're boring. <laughs> but to be bored is to insult one's own intelligence. People don't know... When they're taking this time, it's really the slow boat, China. You're taking your time like a holiday meal. You're not microwaving your tennis game. It's going to be more exciting in the end. Yeah. I tell kids all the time, I say, okay, your social status. I heard this from Brent Wellman, a guy that we worked with a long time ago. You're going to play college tennis. Would you want to get in a minivan and just drive 10 10 miles down the road and play at another college, play against another college? Would you like to get in the minivan? They take you to the airport. You get on an airplane. You fly across the country. You get in another minivan. You go to a hotel. You get in another minivan or the same minivan. They take you to a stadium and you got to pay your dues. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like watching paint dry. But, but I think high, low, high, inside out. Yeah, and the art of coaching, I mean, you can teach basic fundamentals, the stuff that needs to be done, the slow work and, and still make it fun with targets and score. And yeah, the, Peter Burwash, the, pers- the, the personality right? of the pro, but you, the thing is you don't grow away from basics. Uh, yeah. Dave Anderson, he's trained so many people to play college tennis and they come back on holiday. Well, must be a good program. They didn't get worse. A lot of kids, when they go to college, they, they grow up, they become more mature. They're physically stronger. They have more experience. Yeah. But their game many times can go backwards yeah. because they're, 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 you know, they're, they're too cool for school. You know, they're not looking for a backboard on campus. Yeah. Uh, they're not getting in front of a mirror. Okay. They've, um, but the sport doesn't force that like other sports do say, for example, um, you know, shooting a basketball on deck circle, you know, just slowly getting the starting blocks. Yeah. Uh, getting ready to be, you're in the, you're a high jumper. The tennis, it's like, well, and it, ha- it has so much to do with playing the person on the other side of the net. You know, it's like, well, junior tennis, you're going to make 40% on four stairs. <laughs> I'm going to make 45 and you will win. Yeah. And it's like, 
you know that that's actually crummy versus crummier but that you know 85 percent you know when it comes right down to it usually it's higher than that yeah because um there's just so few winners hit so few winners hit or you know i mean they're slap happy and you know that they just you know one ball blast yeah without without technique forehand 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 are we done coach yeah i think so i hope we made some sense yeah thanks for listening everybody uh, we we've covered the serve we covered the forehand so we're going to mix things up between some interviews with with some shots here every once in a while stories stories i have lots of stories yep story storytelling for mental toughness dr jim lair <laughs> now th- thanks again for listening and you can find us on uh social media youtube instagram twitter linkedin all those places you can find our courses for free online or other educational content. Great base tennis. So and goes your palm. So goes your forehand. So Thanks for listening. Palm, so goes your forehand. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.